go ahead and get started uh, as uh, a few people wander in. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to uh, Meadow Hawk Lodge here in beautiful, sunny Yorkville. At least it's not sunny right now, but it was today. My name is Chuck Sutcliffe. I'm chairman of the uh, Kendall County Democratic Central Committee, Kendall County Dems. Um, welcome. Uh, looks like we're going to have a good crowd. The purpose for today is these six people up here. This is the, uh, uh, the forum for the 14th Congressional Democratic candidates. Um, and in order of their, their answering questions, um, Matt Brawley, Lauren Underwood, George Weber, Jim Walls, Victor Swanson, and John Hosta. Not in attendance, um, haven't heard from him, uh, is Daniel Roldan Johnson. Um, he's from up in Lake County area, and uh, I have not heard or met him. But um, welcome, candidates. What we're going to uh, be doing tonight, well, I won't tell you what we're going to be doing tonight. Somebody else will tell you what we're going to do tonight. Um, I want to thank a few people for uh, uh, their, their help in getting this set up. Uh, the candidates, of course, thank you for coming out. Um, Pete and Roxanne Cornwell, uh, they helped uh, uh, immensely in getting things together. Julie Gondar of the Women's uh, Democratic Women of Kendall County, um, instrumental, as well as Rachel Engelhart, Robin Vickers, and Beth Kramer behind the camera over there, uh, also helped uh, put this together, um, and hopefully it will be as, as good as, as uh, uh, we can make it. Um, I also want to thank Christina Zahorek. If you don't know Christina, she is the uh, committee woman for uh, the uh, 14th Congressional District. She is uh, also up for election, so you'll be seeing her on the ballot um, running for re-election. So uh, she's I'm thankful that she's decided to come down here from God knows where up north and uh, uh, moderate our, our, our panel discussion tonight. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Julie Gondar and she'll tell you the rest of uh, the story. <laughs> Some of you in this room are precinct people, yes? Raise your hand if you are. Lifeblood of the party, if you're not, you should be, right? So if you're all from Kendall County or Kane County, make sure you get in touch with your chairs to volunteer to be a precinct committee man or woman, right? Yes. Uh, so the state party has the same kind of a function. 
except our neighborhood is a precinct that is a congressional district. So if you know the 14th, it's a nice, cozy little district. Um, and my counterpart, Mark Gately, is here tonight. Mark. And he is also the chair of the Kane uh, County Democrats. And uh, we are up for election as well. Um, you'll find us way down the ballot after you pass these folks here. So, uh, I also want to say that, um, I want to talk a little bit about the 14th District first, uh, for those of you who, who know or don't know it. It is a large district, seven, uh, parts of seven counties, um, the collar counties, right? So Lake, McHenry, Kane, Kendall, DuPage, um, a little bit of Will, DeKalb. Uh, so it is a district that was carved out in the last census for the other side of the aisle so that we would have safer seats elsewhere um, within the state. And if you are just new to this news, I'm not sure where you've been, but I'm glad you're here now. <laughs> that makes the 14th particularly difficult, right? In addition, um, something else to tell you about the 14th Congressional District is that if you, if you paid attention, this carve out came out after the 2010 census, right? So the numbers that we look at when we look at the 14th are fairly new numbers. Um, it seems like the 2010 was so long ago, uh, especially with this president. Every day seems like a year. Uh, but that being said, the Cook Report, which is a, for those of you who are living in the bubble of politics all the time, is a report that's put out that does a variety of um, analyses and uses a lot of different algorithms to determine in various races how these races are likely to go in a nutshell, right? And they rank them all. And the 14th has been stuck in the likely Republican column for quite some time. The 6th Congressional District, which you may have been reading about, Mr. Roscom, whose sign I saw on the way down. He has part of the county. Um, that district has moved along the continuum in that report from likely leaning to toss up, right? I'd like to see this district move that way as well. Um, the highest win in our district was in 2012, a presidential year, which was Dennis Anderson with 41.7%. Uh, the last, in 2016, uh, Jim Waltz garnered 40.7, 07% in 2016, and in an off year, which this year is, the highest was Dennis Anderson again when he was running at 34.6. Now I say that not to depress you, but I think it's important to understand where we are now, right? So what does this mean for the folks that are vying to face the incumbent? It means that we will have a tough race. But there are a number of changes since November 16. A string of horrific votes happened. Uh, Mr. Hulkrin um, was a part of that and voted uh, with his president. And we also have a president right now in this cycle that's on the other side of the aisle from us, which makes a change. And I think here's the most important part in this race, is that when you're here on the ground, and this is what I tell folks who don't live in this district. And you see the type of attention and the grassroots organizing and all the pop-up groups that are coming out, all those people that you see standing out inside of Holcren's office in the freezing cold with their signs, the folks that are planning the, I think it's King County Coalition with the hearse that's going to be driven through the district, right? Um, all of that activism is making a difference. A huge difference because what those of us, this is my first term, but those of us who've been paying attention, one of the biggest hurdles that we have is I think that people in the district don't really know who Randy is. And they're starting to find out. And that's making a difference. And so what that also means is that it's our duty in this primary when we have real choices on the Democratic side to choose the best qualified candidate who's going to face that incumbent 
in the general election in November. So this is serious business. Um, having been, uh, years ago I used to work for Paul Simon out in Washington, D.C. on the Senate subcommittee. So I'm particularly interested in policy. Um, and being a congressman or a congresswoman is serious business. And you all know that because we're suffering the effects now of policies put in place by people, many of whom, including I would say our president, who aren't qualified. Um, and I think we've forgotten that this is a serious job. And it requires us to look closely at our candidates. And it's time to move beyond generalizations and candidates aligning themselves with other candidates but standing up for themselves and talk policies, differences, and strengths. Veiled attacks about Johnny come lately, closet Republicans, and so on, are not necessary and are not helpful to the process. So with that in mind, I know we have a lot of candidates. We do have a timekeeper. And uh, I, I think it's, is it five, two minutes per question? Five minutes? What's the time frame? Two minutes for each question? Okay, so we'll first we'll start out with a two-minute opening, three-minute opening of introductions. Okay, and I also will say that I do have a copy of the questions that were sent around to all the candidates, but I also have my own. Okay, so are we ready? Giddy up? Are we ready? Fire it up? Let's go. Also, I should say, it's okay if I don't call you because you're president of your village. So I'm not going to use that honorific. Are you okay? Uh, Matt Brown. This is going to get dangerous. All right. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I know there is nothing else on TV to watch, so... Uh, <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, tonight we gather just about a mile from the house that Randy Hall uh, currently occupies in Plano. And the irony is not lost on me that he's sitting in the Capitol tonight listening to Donald Trump address the nation. Cheering. We're here tonight. What's that? He's cheering. He's cheering. Yeah. Yes. And we're here tonight talking about his replacement. One of us will replace him later on this year. And that's why you guys are all here today. So I really do appreciate you taking time out of your life uh, to come and be with us tonight. Uh, my name is Matt Crowley. I'm the mayor in Montgomery. I'm serving my second term. Uh, been doing that for five years. Was on a post last time really focusing on what mayors have to do and actually solve problems and get things done. We've uh, funded our infrastructure, we've cut taxes, and we've funded our public safety. The rational, level-headed stuff that mayors are supposed to be doing. In fact, I think all of our elected officials need to be doing just that. But outside of that, I'm an engineer. I'm rational, level-headed, and uh, Washington is certainly broken. I think we can all benefit uh, from sending an engineer to fix Washington. I do want to say that the other reason why we're all here tonight is every one of us in this room has been harmed by the dozens of terrible votes that Congressman Holkin has taken this year alone. Uh, the two biggest ones that you know of are the health care bill that thankfully died and the tax plan that won't benefit hardly anybody in this room or the district. So that's how we're going to flip this district. It was drawn as a Republican district. But with your help, we will flip this later on this year. So you'll hear a lot more from all of us tonight. Matt Rowley, and I'm running for Congress. Thank you. Yeah. Charles, I want to say thank you for running. Because it's not easy to run for any office, let alone something like this. So thank you all for stepping up and doing the right thing and being engaged and fighting the good fight. And next we have Lauren Underwood. Thanks, Christina. Good, good evening, everyone. My name is Lauren Underwood. I'm also running for Congress here in the 14th District. I'm a registered nurse from Naperville. And uh, like many of you, after the election in 2016, I was stunned to see that Donald Trump had won. At that time, I was an appointee in the Obama administration, was working in public health emergencies and disasters and uh, knew that I could not stay in government and sort of help the Trump team take away health care coverage from millions of Americans. And so I knew I needed to come back home and continue the work of expanding access to care for so many people. Uh, and so when I got, when I stayed until the administration to the very end the last day, it was so sad, very awful. 
And when I moved back home, I started working for a Medicaid managed care plan in Chicago. And began you know, talking with people and started uh, hearing that uh, the party was looking for someone to run against Randy Holcren. And I was so excited to hear this that the party, the Democratic Party, was paying attention to what I knew to be true was that there's Democrats here, we're engaged, we're involved, and that we have had a terrible representative for a number of years. Uh, and so, like I suspect many of you in this room, I attended the town hall at the Arcata Theater last spring in St. Charles, where Mr. Holcren held his one and only public event. And at that town hall, he addressed a number of issues. But the one that I was most interested in hearing from him on was health care. And he promised, at that event that he was not going to vote for a version of Affordable Care Act repeal that made it more difficult for folks with pre-existing conditions to be able to afford health care coverage. Now that's important to me because obviously as a nurse I know that health care coverage is critical for people with chronic illnesses who might need to have their medication or be able to get procedures. It's important to me because I work to implement the Affordable Care Act as a federal employee at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. But it's also really important to me because like many Americans, I have a chronic illness, a pre-existing condition myself. It's a heart condition. And while it's well controlled, it's one of those diagnoses where I wouldn't necessarily be able to get coverage under a repeal scenario. So he made that promise before our community, I believed him, and then a week to 10 days later, he went and voted for that American Health Care Act that did the opposite of his promise. And I got angry. And it wasn't because of the vote, it was because he didn't have the integrity to be honest with us the one time he was planning to stand before our community. And that's not what a representative is supposed to do. And so, I decided in that moment, it's on. I am running, and so I launched the campaign in August. Here we are, the last week of January, less than 50 days from our primary election where we have the opportunity to send forward a, or a, a nominee to challenge Randy Holcren. Again, Lauren Underwood, so glad to be here with you. Thank you to the Kendall County Dems for working. great turnout here today. I'm glad to see so many people are interested in what's going on. My name is George Weber. I'm running for Congress in the 14th District. Um, I'm a just retired chemical engineer. My wife and I live in Lakewood, which is just outside of Crystal Lake. We have three grown children. They're off in different parts of the country being productive. Um, yeah, to, to do something like this, you really need to have a good reason to do it, because I tell you, it's not always fun standing out in parking lots collecting signatures and stuff like that. Um, my main reason for running is that I don't want my kids to grow up in a world where there's no middle class, where the environment and the planet is destroyed, where the country's broke, the healthcare system stinks, and nothing is getting done in Washington. I'm not, I don't have a lot of political background, I have very little political background, but I can tell you my main reason for running is that from what we see going on right now, the problem is that if you want to do something right, you got to do it yourself, and that's why I decided to run. And I'm going to try and go through my platform really quickly because of the fact that you know, we have questions coming up and all that. Uh, but basically, my main platform item, if you look at the brochures on the table, is prosperity for the middle class. A country without a middle class is a third world country, and that's the way this country is quickly going. My parents were immigrants from Europe. My father worked his entire career on an assembly line at a Chevy engine plant. He was able to provide us with a middle class lifestyle. He was able to retire at a reasonable age. I had many of the same opportunities. I asked my son once about what he thought about retirement. He said, I'm going to have to work until I'm 80 years old. I said, that's not going to happen. But that's, that's what's happening right now. That's, that's kind of what the next generation is looking at. They're not going to have many of the same opportunities that we have, that some of the older folks here have. And we need to change things. And nothing's getting done. Uh, and Go, I can spend a half hour going through the reasons for that. The best thing to do if you want to see the details, go to my website. But the next thing is solving what I call our easily solvable problems. And they're easily solvable because we know what the answers are. The problems are jobs. We know we need more vocational training. We uh, the Climate change, we know what the answer is for that. The debt, we paid off our debt after World War II. It was bigger than it is now. We can do it again. We just have to do the same thing. 
and then we have to uh, get a better healthcare system. All we have to do is copy what the Canadian and European co uh, countries already have. Final thing is we have to take back our government. Everything the government is doing right now goes against the will of the people. That's not the way a democracy is supposed to work. And that's our, our, we, we've totally lost control of our government. That needs to change. And unfortunately, it's not going to take just going there and voting. We, we, we need somebody who's going to be the, go there and be tough, and that's what I plan to be. So anyways, uh, hopefully I can answer a lot of questions coming up. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you showed up here. It's good. It's a good turnout. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Jim Waltz. Thank you, Christina. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I think there's going to be more people in this room than in the audience uh, in Washington, D.C. this evening. I'll just tell you that. My name is uh, Jim Waltz. I was a Democratic candidate running against Randy Hoffman in November of 2016, and the fight is not over. I heard my calling about 12 years ago when, as a sales representative, I made the mistake of turning off sports and music and turning on current events. At the end of the radio talk show, I heard the words that changed my life. Democracy starts with you. It is not a spectator sport. Tag, you're it. When I looked to Washington, D.C., I asked myself the question, if pro is the opposite of con, what does that say about the words progress, and Congress. We have too many politicians in Washington, D.C. Politicians only look as far as the next election. Representatives look as far as the next generation and beyond. I pledge to the people of the 14th Congressional District that I will bring your voice, your vote to Washington, D.C. and bring representation to the 14th Congressional District. With the actions and words that are uttered out of the occupants of the White House, Randy Hulkren and the Republican Party are complicit in their silence when they don't speak out against the words that are coming out of that man's mouth or off of his fingers. When he speaks about the hatred towards the Muslims with the Muslim ban, when he talks out against our friends in Haiti, Africa, and underfunds the relief efforts in Puerto Rico, you see Donald Trump. You see that his soul is blinded by the glare of, a, the, the glare of his whiteness. We have to stop Donald Trump. We have to stop the Republican Party. But keep this in mind as well. We have to draw a distinction between Republican politicians and Republican voters. Republican voters are our neighbors our friends, and our family members. We're all in this together. Disease and misfortune knows no political strife. I thank you so much for being here tonight. I look forward to answering all the questions that you happen to have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the five of us have been on this road for a long time. We've talked about how we can pretty much give each other speeches after a while. We <laughs> talks about his calling, and, and my calling is a little different. Um, my calling goes back to uh, January 20th of 2016. Actually, about a year and a half before that, because a year and a half before that, as a high school teacher, I signed up to take students to the inauguration of the next president of the United States. Sounds like a good plan, right? Until you found out who won the election. And then it sent me into therapy and deep depression. <laughs> My therapist says the more I talk about it, the better I'll feel. It hasn't worked so far. But we went to the inauguration anyways, and on that day I had a student crying in the crowd because of the lack of decorum that was happening. Chuck Schumer was booed so loudly that we couldn't hear anything that he was saying. Barack Obama was booed so loudly that we couldn't hear him as well. And this is not what democracy is supposed to be. And this is not what democracy is supposed to look like. The next day we went to the Women's March. 
And to be honest, if I reflect and I look back on things, even more so this year than I have over the past year, the Women's March is what really put me here today. Because the Women's March was everything right about democracy. Everything right about what we want in a society. We want to be on the right side of history. And as a history teacher, I often look at what's the right side of history. And the Women's March was the right side of history. And everything that they talk about at that Women's March, whether it's equal pay for equal work, whether it's um, help, helping the environment or health care, all of those things are on the right side of history. And that's where I want to be. And that's why I'm here today. So I started this in May. And I'm not going to end until we take Randy Hulkern out of office. Thank you. My name is John Hosta, H-O-S-T-A, like plant. Um, how do we begin? 30 years ago, I won't say I really had my calling 30 years ago, but I would say 30 to 40 years ago is when we started to see things really start to deteriorate in this country. Our trade policies, I don't know if you remember the, the oil shortage that we had back in the 70s. I'm close to 60 years old now. And uh, it's amazing how the oil shortage just sort of just, dis just sort of disappeared. We have plenty of oil today, it seems like. But the funny thing is, the car that I drove back in 1975, uh, what I got about what 18, 20 miles a gallon, 25. The car I'm driving today is getting about 18, 20, 25 miles a gallon. This is evidence of who's in charge of our country and our economy. The research we have about energy is a joke. We need to wake up. Where's the electric cars? One of my relatives had one of the first electric cars back in the early 1900s in Detroit. That's the area that I, that I grew up near. Spent a lot of time there. We start looking at research like that in our, in our energy. We start looking at research in our health areas. The pharmaceutical companies are in charge of our health system. People live outside of this country normally to, what, 105, 110? What's the average length that someone is expected to live here? 87, 85, if you're lucky. We have a polluted food system. We're importing. We're we supply, we, we want to make sure we have a good food supply. That's one of the vital interests in our country is to make sure we have a vital food supply. So what do we do? We subsidize our farmers, and of course we bring in competition from China and others all over the world. To compete against our farmers, really? Foreign meat, who knows what's in that stuff? What is it, uh, 10 years ago was when the baby formula thing came out where we weren't even having real baby formula coming from, from China or, or the, the apple juice. It was antifreeze. This is the kind of stuff that's happening in our country. We have a national debt, what, $21 trillion? That is so high in proportion to our GNP that we've never seen this before. And, and the only time we've ever seen anything proportionally close to what we have today is when we had wars, World War II, different wars. We were on the wrong path, we've been on the wrong path for 35 years, and we as a as society need to wake up. We better get on track and fix this thing with our trade policies, our banking policies, we gotta get rid of the monopolies in our health system, our banking constructs. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I do know in terms of the questions, just so the audience knows too, there were some questions that were prepared uh, by the candidates and the, right, um, that were submitted uh, to the candidates, but I also have some add-ons of my own um, that they don't know about. The game here is not to trick people, um, it's not to embarrass people, it's to get to some policy questions and things that we really want to know about, right? Um, so one of the first things I know that we ask in our, uh, in our county is whenever a county candidate comes up is what are you doing to be prepared should you actually gain that office? 
And I think that's a question that we're going to start off with here in this panel, is what are you doing to be prepared should you be so fortunate, fortunate enough to go to Washington, D.C. and represent the 14th Congressional District? Um, things like, uh, and, and in addition, now that you're doing prepare, like are you watching CNN, are you reading transcripts, um, but also what committees are you interested in possibly serving on? Um, and uh, the third part of that is, what will be your first piece of original legislation? So uh, there is no um, order, but I think we'll start, uh, if you don't mind, at the other end and come back this way. Um, so Mr. Hasta, the question is to you. So what are you doing to prepare? Should you win? Is there a particular committee that you're interested in serving on? And what is your first piece of original legislation? What are we doing to be prepared? I think we've been trying to be prepared for this, like I said, for the last 30 years. I don't have uh, a set agenda when I get into office as of right now, I'll be honest with you. I think one of the first things I want to look at, if I was to take, sometimes what I've been asked in the past is what is my, what is my dream legislation? What is the number one thing that I really want to see happen in, in Congress? I'd love to see a proposal where the, uh, where the Federal Reserve becomes under the direct supervision of the Congress, which it is to a degree. But I'd like to see that money that's being paid out in dividends to foreign bankers come back to this country. We're, we're giving out roughly one and a half billion dollars annually, minimally, possibly up to ten billion dollars to foreign bankers. And we're, we're quibbling over over food stamp programs, over over all these different things where where the money's going. But yet we're giving billions of dollars, free money away to, to foreign, foreign foreign bankers. And it's not even constitutional. When's the last time a constitutional person stood up and said, this isn't constitutional? Probably the first time you heard anybody say anything like that is right here. Right here. Because I'm brave enough to stand up and say it's garbage. We're talking about cutting Social Security, or we're going to send off billions of dollars off with the banking construct. An uncon unconstitutional banking construct. We need to start looking at different things like that differently. As well as the energy program, as I talked about earlier. If I was to serve on any committee, I would love to be on, to start off the energy committee, looking at different resources, magnetic energy. I mean, not even looking at wind, windmill in, uh, energy, wind in energy, sun in in energy. But we start looking at different metals that are used to propel energy, propel motors, uh, conductivity that is that's high energy that, that moves energy much faster. Wasn't it Tesla said that if he was funded that he could bring about enough energy to illuminate the entire world and yet a hundred years later we're still quibbling over oil and fossil fuels? Thank you. Next we have Mr. Swanson. Uh, in terms of what I've been doing to prepare for Congress, I've been teaching uh, 15, 16, 17 year olds for 17 years. I think that that pretty much well compares to what we have in Congress these days. Um, no, I've been going around and talking to individuals, cons uh, future constituents, finding out what they're, what are important to them. Um, I've been having discussions with uh, conservative people, finding out how we can find some common ground, and we'll talk about some common ground in, in, in a little bit. Um, if I were on uh, my dream committee, of course, as a teacher, would be the education committee. Um, I love education. I believe education solves so many problems, and it is through education that we can uh, grow our economy and, be, and have poverty become a, a, a less of a factor with the education becoming a great equalizer. Uh, my very first piece of legislation, legislation that I would propose would be universal pre-K. I believe that through universal pre-K, we can help solve these issues that we have today. There's a um, Nobel laureate uh, econ economist at the University of Chicago named James Heckman who, come, who has developed the Heckman equation. And he talks about the more that you invest, especially in low income areas, in children from birth to pre-K, the more return on investment you get. And if conservatives are all about fiscal responsibility, that's where we get them when we talk about return on investment and spending with universal pre-K. So my first piece of legislation would be on universal pre-K. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
so much. What have I been doing to prepare myself? Well, I've been crisscrossing the, uh, the district from Plano to Yorkville, from Antioch to Geneva, in temperatures from minus one to 94, talking to everybody, not just Democrats, but talking to everybody. I cannot tell you how many times I knocked on thousands of doors the last election cycle, I'm knocking on thousands more. The best and longest conversations I have, people turn out to be Republican. Because what happens to me most is that we're more alike than we are not alike. We will perpetually agree to disagree on the edges about a lot of things. But there's so much area of agreement, we have to come together. I've gone behind quote unquote enemy lines. I used to go to Joe Walsh Town Halls, dating back to 2010. I've gone to Bruce Rauner, Tea Party, Patriot, Meet the Candidates forums. I've challenged the status quo. You can teach by questions you ask at town halls. The first piece of legislation, though, that I would uh, introduce the immorality of the tax, the tax bill that the Republicans passed before the end of the year to take away health coverage from the most vulnerable while giving tax breaks to the rich, that is immoral. I believe that health care is a right and not a privilege. The first piece of legislation that I would introduce within the first 100 days is a hybrid between H.R. 676, the John Conyers Medicare for All bill, single payer bill, and the bill introduced by Bernie Sanders is a hybrid, which his bill takes five years. A hybrid be between the two. The last part of the question, sorry about that. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. The most powerful committee, Ways and Means. But understand this, there will be such a learning curve. I will, I pledge, with as little time as the Republicans spend and make schedule for people to be in Washington, D.C., half of that time they spend money, rate, rate, spend time raising money. I will keep my nose down, my eyes and ears open, and my mouth shut, and I will learn as much as I can, and I will go to any committee that I think I can contribute to. Thank you. Thank you. Being an engineer, to solve problems, you learn that the only way to solve a problem and come up with the best solution is to do it based on facts and data. That's the only way to solve a problem and to a great solution to it. Um, my whole career I spent solving problems and then not only doing that but convincing people to, to implement my solutions. I've got a number of projects out there with multi-millions of dollars that are running. I have a website called Human Efficiency that uh, has identified all the problems we have in government. I, I was blogging for about a year before I started doing this. If you want to go see what the solutions are to all of our problems, they're all, all there, laid out there already. Um, we need to do a better job of implementing or marketing the solutions we have to our problems, like health care. There's about a lot of false information going on around, around Washington about health care that the Republicans use to shoot down uh, going to a better system. We got to stop doing that, and that's what I that's why I would like to do is convince people in Washington as far as what the good solutions are. First thing I'm going to do when I get to Washington is take back our, start taking back our government. Citizens United decision is the one thing that we have to get rid of first. Eighty percent of the people in this country are against Citizens United. That's not just Democrats, Republicans. There's only a few points spread between Democrats and Republicans. They're against the two, yet it keeps getting voted out. There were two, two times there was a thing called the Disclose Act, which was uh, uh, intended to legislate that away. It got voted down. We can't allow that to happen anymore. We need to take back our government. What I would like to do is put that Disclose Act forward again. If it gets voted down, what we need to do then is I would like to leave the, the people in a rebellion against the Congress, basically. The people are voting against that. We can't allow this to happen anymore. They have to represent us. And we have to be more militant about it. And I plan on doing that. That's my first thing.
So I've been running my campaign to try to achieve those objectives. Um, and we're running a people-driven, people-powered campaign. Um, and it's really powered by the people of the 14th district. Um, and so I think that that's really critical. When I think about another way to be effective as your member of Congress, it's based on relationships. And so we've been building relationships with folks in every part of our district. Um, and hopefully, you know, those relationships will yield dividends uh, once we get to Washington. Um, when I think about committees, uh, health care is something that is incredibly broken in our country. And I believe deeply that we need a nurse at the table when we are making the decisions to fix our health care system. There are three committees in the Congress that have jurisdiction over health care in the House, three committees. Uh, there's Ways and Means, there's Energy and Commerce, and there's uh, Education and the Workforce. And I'd be honored to have a place on any of those committees. And, you know, they'll submit my name uh, forward and hopefully be assigned to the Subcommittee on Health and any of the three. And then finally, when I think about uh, early pieces of legislation to uh, offer and send forward, I think we are more than overdue uh, for some movement and some action on uh, three basic economic uh, policies that would offer tremendous security for families here in Northern Illinois. Those are things like affordable child care, uh, paid family leave, and equal pay. These are three nonpartisan economic security policies that have gotten no movement in the Congress because we don't have representatives and we don't have leaders in the House that are willing to expend their political capital to see them through. It's time for that to change. And the women, particularly in our community, would benefit greatly. Thank you. Can you guys hear OK in back? I'm having a hard time hearing myself, but that's perfect. Um, so <clears throat> obviously, being your representative would mean connecting with all of you, correct? Going to as many things as I can do and listening to what your needs are and how the economy, healthcare, uh, your infrastructure is impacting you. But it's more than that. So to prepare myself for this, uh, outside of uh, really trying not to listen to CNN much anymore because it's so negative, uh, but reading everything I can do, briefs on the transportation bill that the president's probably uh, unveiling uh, right as we speak now, uh, which I can get into at another time, uh, but really reading all the things that I can read and talking to experts in the field, uh, that, that know, you know, the people on my staff are engineers uh, about water quality, transportation funding, and that. Which leads me to my uh, committees. Uh, as a licensed civil engineer, I think I can provide uh, much needed uh, benefits to, the, to transportation and environment issues. Uh, would, would see me, myself, sorry, being uh, an advocate or being helpful on those committees. The first piece of legislation that I would introduce is actually I've written this policy proposal uh, when I applied for a White House fellowship maybe three years ago. And you never heard of it because it's not very exciting. But it probably stands the best chance of getting passed. The federal government right now grants, has a grant program, they grant the states um, millions of dollars for water main uh, replacement projects. They allow those grants to go out at 0% interest. The state of Illinois turns around and charges us 6% interest on that loan when they administer it. So I would introduce legislation that would require that those loans go out competitively, but at 0% to municipalities, uh, to keep costs for our infrastructure and uh, for our water, sewers, roads, and bridges to keep that down. Like I said, not terribly exciting, but probably something that actually will pass. And that's kind of my MO. Thank you. So I should say that they, unbeknownst to me, they were all, uh, had drawn lots. Uh, about who was speaking first and so on and so forth. I completely upended it like I want to do. Um, but we'll keep rotating um, to make sure that everybody has a chance to answer the questions <coughs> first, if that's okay with the panel. Um, and in addition, you all also, for the teachers that are in the room, how many teachers or retired teachers in the room? Thank you for not calling me out. Um, I said they were listed alphabetically, but as you all can see, <laughs> they are not. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. So thank you for that, Grace. Um, as Democrats, we're all Democrats in the room, regardless of what prefix you want to call yourself, at the end of the day, we're all Democrats. And I'm assuming that you are all familiar with the party platform that was passed um, 
in 2016 and you align yourselves with most of that platform, if not all, is there any issue in particular that uh, you don't agree with? And we can start with, um, do you want to go this end or maybe you should have um, Victor start first since we had John go last. Did you want to speak about the platform? Thank you. I think the one thing that the Democrats need to do is stop uh, being so insistent on campaign donations. Uh, it's not necessarily in their platform, but if we want to be the party that speaks for the people and not the corporations, we need to act like that. And we need to stop thinking about all the money that we're getting from corporations, whether it's banks or insurance companies, and we need to work for the people instead of uh, do that. So I would, I would add to the platform instead of take away from the platform, something that would uh, maybe take away from certain different types of donations uh, that would limit our donations. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, I, I agree, actually, with, with, with Victor. Uh, I, I've signed a pledge. It, it, it's not what's in the platform, it's the omissions from it. You know, the, if you re harken back to the Republican primary, when Donald Trump was running for the nomination, he ran as a populist. He ran on protecting Medicare. He ran on protecting Social Security. He ran, ran on bringing jobs back from overseas. Those are all populist issues. All issues that were advanced with the inclusion of a more progressive platform. I've signed a pledge, as far as campaign financing, I'm an advocate for the public financing of federal elections. I've signed a pledge to take zero PAC money, to take zero corporate contributions, because I will be beholden to you. Those are the things that are omitted from the platform that I will work for in addition to everything that is in there. A much more progressive platform. And, and just to be clear, on page 22, it does talk about campaign finance reform in the Democratic platform. Okay, let me make just a couple comments about the, uh, what I think the Democrats are doing wrong. And this, this is actually, I heard this on television once, I thought it was a good idea, but the two things I keep hearing about, number one, Democrats are too nice. We gotta stop being so nice. We gotta put our foot down. I tell you, the Republicans, they will, of course, right away, if somebody says anything wrong, they just go wild about it. And, and the Democrats are all sitting back and not doing anything. We have to be, start being tougher. The other thing is we have to have a clear message. You know, during the last presidential election, Trump had his message, make America great again. I'm still not sure what Hillary's message was. And, and we got to, that's one thing we got to do. We have to be, uh, and I don't agree with Trump's message, by the way. Don't, don't get me wrong on that. But, uh, but we need to be more clear on the message. That's why, like in my platform, Prosperity for the Middle Class, that was the first thing I did, was come up with a clear message, say, this is what I'm going after. Okay, that's the one, two things the Democrats have to do. The other thing, it, it's a matter of strategy. The country's divided up into pretty much a third conservative, a third liberal, and a third in the middle, a third moderate. We have to do a better job of bringing the moderates over on our side. You know, that's why we have gridlock in this country, because it's like divide, divide the country in half. And there's a whole big market in the middle that we have to bring over uh, on our side. And I tell you, they're they more than willing to come over if we give them the right information. I believe in doing things based on facts and data. That's why I, uh, that's what my whole platform is based on. I think by having the Democrats do that, we can bring in a whole slew of other people from the Republican side who are moderates, who don't really agree with the Republicans, bring them over to our side. And we can really get stuff done then. We, we need to do that. Thank you. Are you a progressive? Are you a centrist? And my answer. 
answer every time is that I'm a Democrat. And I think that being a Democrat means something. Uh, I, I struggle with sort of the, the premise of the question, to be honest, because I believe that as Democrats, we need to stand for certain things. We need to stand for choice. We need to stand for public education. We need to stand for health care as a human right. Those are just basic things that we all should believe as Democrats, in my opinion. And so um, that's how I define myself. Uh, that's what I believe in, and I can't necessarily call out any particular thing that I would want to walk away from on our platform. Thank you. So a couple of things. Um, kind of goes back to messaging. I think, uh, you know, on Hillary's platform, and I don't know if it's specifically in the, in the Democratic Party one, her economic climb is 116 points. Uh, really hard to message that with the electorate, which I think is, could be part of our problem. That we're, we, uh, Donald Trump puts everything on a bumper sticker, and folks were able to relate to that and say that he was going to bring their coal jobs back, which he's clearly not. Uh, we need to be investing in things like renewable energies and uh, renewable technologies and that. Uh, the other thing that I don't know specifically if it's in the uh, platform or not, uh, it most definitely talks about a reduction in nuclear arms. I would like to see us redu reduce those to zero, have the whole world be uh, absent of uh, nuclear bombs. I don't think that really uh, would ever help any sort of uh, war or anything that we work on. Uh, it would only make things worth worse catastrophically. So if that is in there, I totally agree with it. If it's not, let's get it. <laughs> Country has to come from the working class out, working class out, I should say. The biggest problem we have today is we think somehow that the business leaders and the, and, and the leadership that's way up there that, that earns all the money is, is what's going to bring us to prosperity and it doesn't. The country's always been based on, on building from the even, even the bottom up. It's when, the, when, the, when this country became united with unions, came with understanding of the working class is when we really started seeing the, the value, or I should say, the, the economic surge in this country. And we've lost that today. Today, we, I believe that the main thing is to, is to focus on the working class, make sure the unions have a voice. I think that's diminished, diminishing. And what's happening today is we see the, the control, the monopolies, and every single, every single eco structure that we have, no matter what it is, we see that being monopolized from the, from the top down. Our tax structure, top down. We didn't even pay personal income tax uh, the working class prior to the 1900s. That's been new. So what's happened is the reduction of the corporate tax and increase in taxes and the burden on the, on, the, on the middle class. In order for us to be prosperous, I believe that as Democrats, that's where it has to be, from the middle class up. Thank you. doesn't do town halls, doesn't, doesn't occasional coffee. 
but it, it's only in a very rare instance does he make himself available. That's probably, that could be the number one issue, is the total lack of representation. That's what I see. Uh, the number one thing that I see going and knocking on doors and standing on parking lots collecting signatures was that how many people hate, hate, hate politicians in Washington. I cannot believe how many people told me they, they do not like politicians anymore. And that's unfortunate because there are a lot of good politicians in Washington. It's not all of them, but unfortunately, you know, a couple bad eggs are bringing down the whole system. Not just, I mean, uh, when you look at Congress, the uh, approval rating for Congress is right now 20%. And it's been 20% for years. That's because they're not implementing the policies that we want. You know, you look at public opinion polls, <coughs> The, the answers are out there as far as what people want, uh, whether it be health care, better health care system. Now the majority of people want that, want a European or Canadian style system. Climate change, they want to do something about that. And, and, and nothing's getting done in Washington, and we need to change that. And unfortunately, by just going to Washington and having our, our, our politicians stand there and sit there and vote, it's not getting anything done. We need to change it. We need to be a little bit more uh, boisterous, I guess is the best way to put it. And I plan on doing that. I plan on going there, and if the politicians don't do what the people want, then we're going to have to, it's going to come out to the people, and we have to, the people have to fight back against us. We can't allow this stuff to go on anymore. And that's that's really what I plan on doing. That's why I'm running for office, because I, I don't feel anything's getting done. And based on what I'm hearing, people are not happy about it. And there's a lot of people who are not happy about it. that I get is what can we do to make health care more affordable for families? How can we lower the prices of prescription drugs? Do we have the courage to really go to the pharmaceutical companies and attempt drug price negotiations? Do we have the courage to challenge them? And do we have the courage to fight on behalf of families in our area? Um, I get questions about how can we lower premium prices so that if we have health care coverage, we can afford to use it. Um, and so this, this issue of affordability is something that I think is going to be really critical to get some movement on. Um, I think that Washington, and particularly Randy Holcren, has been so narrowly focused on just repealing and not solutions-oriented on the issues that are going to impact the livelihoods and pocketbooks of families across our district. And so um, they really missed an opportunity, I think, this year to really help us. Um, they missed that opportunity with the tax plan that does not help us. And in fact, it only just further destabilizes our health care system, right? You all know that in that tax plan was a provision that uh, removed that individual mandate. So when it goes into effect in 2019, we're going to be in a world of hurt. Um, that's not a provision that helps families afford coverage. It's not something that helps families lower their tax burden. It's not a, it's not a policy that helps families in the slightest. And um, I hear a lot every day about affordability and healthcare coverage, making sure everybody can get the care that they need and being able to afford prescription drugs. I think we need to really hone in and focus on those policy issues um, and, and stop it sort of with all this divisiveness and just trying to implode and destroy programs. It doesn't work well. So the one thing that I hear more than anything is, and I, I probably disagree with uh, with Jim just a, a little bit on this, is that people know who Randy Holcren is and they really, really want to get rid of it. And that is the one thing we talk about in every meeting that I've been at since I launched the campaign in June, uh, and how we can go about doing that. And that starts with everybody in this room. Uh, when I first launched the campaign, it was right around the time of the, the uh, health care bill. And so Randy had held this town hall and said he wasn't what he wasn't going to do, and then he turned around and did that. Uh, so we held a town hall uh, here in Yorkville so that we can give people that outlet, uh, actually collect their comments, wrap them up, and submit them to Randy Holcren's office because he's unwilling to come here and talk about that. 
Uh, but healthcare is certainly a problem. We, uh, I didn't even tell both of this. My wife Rosa and the kids are here today. Um, but I didn't even uh, mention this to her yet. When we got our W-2 the other day, it said that our healthcare coverage for our four, family of four, which is the district free only coverage, cost $23,000 last year, most of it being paid by the school. That is an insanely high amount of money for us to be paying. But I'm sure there's people in this room who pay a lot more than that. So it's the insurance is expensive, but the care, it all starts back with the care, and the care is very expensive. So the next congressman that takes the seat is going to have uh, to seriously look at patching the ACA, because they're punching holes into it with the um, uh, individual mandate and everything that they're pulling out of it, not funding the uh, portions of it, patching it back up, and then improving upon that, right? The ACA was a huge step in the right direction. I stand for the health care plan that gets the most people in this country coverage, whatever that might be. Uh, but inching the ball forward. As an engineer, I think that's uh, uh, one of the things that I strive on the most is move the ball towards the end zone every single day. And so I hear a lot about replacing Randy and a lot about health care. Thank you. Healthcare uh, problem is uh, definitely the number one thing that comes up. Uh, if you look at our healthcare system, uh, it, is, it isn't just, there's so many different fixes that need to be put into place in order to free that up, because it's a cost issue. So what happens is that we, we need to go across state lines, open up uh, competition with insurance companies, but at the same time, we do have to open up negotiation with phar pharmaceutical companies to make sure that they lower their prices. But we also need to bring in alter alternative medical solutions. We don't do that in this country. There's many different solutions that are out there that aren't simply chemicals. And we need to realize that. We realize that in the farming industry. There's many different, different uh, solutions to help animals that do not involve chemicals. So we need, to, we need to research that. We need to bring that into play. We also need to bring into play we call it the community hospital that's very privatized that also monopolizes a particular area. So what happens is they are basically being able to charge almost any type of cost that they want to on simple things like x-rays and what have you. In order to lower, lower uh, costs, insurance costs, we need to bring in more competition at all those different levels at, at the grassroots area, which is what we're spending on health care. These are the things we need to focus on. And uh, these are things we're, we're not focusing on at all in Washington, and that's what we need to bring to the table. Thank you. So in my travels throughout the district, I've heard a lot of different concerns, but the main concern is Washington's inability to get things done. Uh, just after Sandy Hook, over 90% of the public agreed with universal background checks. We do not have universal background checks. Seventy-some percent of the population believes in giving the uh, DACA children amnesty and allowing them to stay here. We're not getting that done. Uh, we hear about health care and tax reform, but Washington's inability to get things done because Washington is so divisive and nobody wants to stand up and say, well, I gave a little too much on this issue, so we'll get something on this issue because they'll see it as weak and a failure, and that needs to change. And we need to be able to work compromises just as compromise has been throughout our history uh, as a history teacher. Uh, there I go again. Um, so um, those are things that we need to do. Washington's inability to get things done that the majority of the population wants. We, that's what we need to work on. Thank you. Submitted questions that we're going to ask. Um, so first off, uh, Amanda sent an email in. I'm assuming Amanda's not here. Hi, Amanda. Hi. Is this Blake with you as well? Okay. So hi, Amanda and Blake. So Blake is eight years old, right? And I'm impressed that you're here. So thank you for coming. This is our future, right there. Um, and he had a question in specific. Are you okay if I ask the question? Did you want to ask, Blake? Come on up if you want to ask. Blake. Oh, okay. Um, okay? 
know, questions from kids are always the hardest. So, so this is Blake's question. Oh, yeah. How do you feel about money for autistic kids at schools? Um, hi, my name is Blake. I am eight years old. I live in Plano, and I'm autistic. Thank you. Very brave. for autistic services, right? Um, so, uh, I believe we left with Mr. Walls and now we're up to Mr. Weber, is that correct? Okay, hopefully I can do justice in answering your question. Uh, I, I, obviously we have to fund all the education that everybody needs. You know, nobody can, the one thing about uh, and this goes along, with, along the same lines as health care. You know, nobody knows what's going to happen to people. I could get sick tomorrow. Any, anything could happen to people. And uh, everybody needs to have a good health care system. Everybody needs to have good education, so education available to them. So we need to, and that needs to be funded. And there's, uh, and, you know, the, I guess getting kind of looking at the parallel with, uh, with like education and uh, health care that uh, we need to fund this and, and it needs to be funded by the government or I shouldn't say by the government but the government needs to take control of these things um, as far as the education system you know I'm not for uh, charter schools I think our public school system needs to be funded properly and it can do the job my, my wife's a middle school math teacher by the way and uh, we need so we need to have our, our public schools funded we need to have health care system that's a, I don't want to call it single payer, but we need to have a, a system where um, it's a single insurance system, which is what they have in Canada, which is one of the misnomers. It's not run by the government, it's a single insurance system. So that everybody has health care, and uh, I know I'm not jumping around here, but that, in my opinion, that's, that's what we need to do. And, uh, it's just so, it could be so simple, but it's being made so complicated. We're the only people who worry about things like education. By the way, education, the other thing about education, we need a better vocational education system in this country. Germany spends about six times what we do on vocational training. That's one of the reasons we, that we have, so many, we have so many jobs out there that are not being filled because we don't have enough trained people for them. So, thank you. us don't either have the courage to ask the questions that are so close to our hearts and to our lives, or sometimes we don't have the chance. And so you took the chance, and your mom did too, and so thank you for asking first. Um, I think it's really important, very important, to properly fund our public education system. It's critical, not just for kids like Blake, but for all of our kids. And so all of our schools need to have the funds and the resources that they need so that all of our students can learn in the best way that works for them. And so that means that we need additional resource educators or they need some special one-on-one -on -one attention or a full special ed program. Each school district needs to have the resources in order to do that. And right now in our system, that is just not the case. We have so much inequality, school system to school system because of the way public education is funded. At the federal level, the federal government has actually been such a really wonderful partner for our schools in Illinois because the state has had this inconsistent budget situation. And inconsistent is being generous, right? Because our kids have been used as pawns. And so school districts have relied on the federal funds probably more than ever before. I think that there's a lot more that we can be doing to invest in public schools, not restrict funding from public schools, which is what you will hear coming from our congressman, is seeking to restrict funding from public schools. Now, the question was about autism and education. And for me, that can be special ed, but it doesn't have to be special ed, right? Because there is a spectrum. And so some kids are in the mainstream classrooms, but may need additional help, maybe from that reading or, or resource teacher or whomever. 
Um, and we need to be sure that that flexibility exists in each of our programs so that each child gets the education so that they can have the most healthy, well, productive lives. Um, so thanks, Blake, for raising it. Appreciate it. Blake, you're awesome. Seriously, the best question of the night. I really do appreciate that. And you've been so patient waiting to ask that. I would have been right up here at the front. Uh, but I sincerely do appreciate that. It melts my heart to hear an eight-year-old uh, express something that's so personal uh, in front of a group of people certainly is, is, is amazing. And I am 100% committed to uh, funding for all students, right? Every kid deserves a public education and a situation in which they can learn, right? Not just some of the kids, all of the kids. And so, you name it, Blake, anytime, anywhere, I will be with you wherever you need me. Thank you. Uh, when it comes to the funding in schools, I believe all the funding tax credits need to stay with the public school system, uh, first and foremost. I think it's important that the federal government continues to fund all these different special programs uh, as, as possibly, fully as possibly they, as they can. Um, having said that, I do also believe outside of the research that needs to be brought in from the federal government, that's where it stops. I think the federal government should not have a, have a say in the decisions that are made on the grassroots level when it comes to educational decisions. I think that should be left up to the parents and the, and the community and where, the, where that public school serves. But again, um, we should always welcome the money, but the decisions we should remain with the parents. Thank you. There's Blake. Hi, Blake. That question is near and dear to my heart. I have a niece who's a special needs uh, student in Wisconsin. And when Betsy DeVos came out, eliminating the protections for special needs students, saying that they don't deserve a quality education, just like any other student, that broke my heart. And that's another reason why I'm here today. Every student deserves a quality education, no matter where they come from, no matter what their zip code is, no matter what their background is. And we need to ensure that we start investing instead of $25 billion in a wall, <coughs> Billions and billions of dollars in the military industrial complex. We need to start investing in children because they're the future. We need to start investing in children because that's what we value. And if we don't value that, then we need to stand up and start showing what we value. And I value children because I see it every day in the value and what they're going to provide us in society. And I am encouraged every day by my students and I'm encouraged by you, Blake, for our future because of that question. Thank you very much. school board member at Warren Township High School in Gurney. And as has been mentioned here, we need to do everything that we can to provide all the funding necessary for the programs that every, not just from the autistic community, but everybody. You know, I was canvassing in Oswego just a couple days ago, and one of the doors I knocked on, I spoke with a woman for about 10 minutes, and it broke my heart. She has two autistic children. She has to drive one of her children an hour and 20 minutes away because the local school district is not necessarily offering the necessary programs that he needs. It kills me. But we also need to address something that she really got emotional about. Anti-bullying. Okay, my, my wife's a teacher as well. I think everybody up here has a family member that is a teacher. And it, it breaks my heart to, to hear the stories that she comes home with at night. How people, you know, pick on other people. You know, they think it's cute at the time, but it, it's just not right. So I, I will promote any anti-bullying legislation as well. Because we need to give children a safe haven when they, when they try to learn for the future. Thank you very much. keep shocking them all too as I walk up and hand them the mic. Um, that's just to keep them all awake. So you might be getting sleepy, so uh, let's take 
less than five seconds, stand up, <laughs> sit down, say hi to your neighbors if you don't know them, and then we'll get on to the next question. Specifically in the wake of Las Vegas and other shootings, what is your vision for sensible gun safety? And we'll start with one. So it's January 2018, and in the headlines, literally every other day this month, there has been another mass shooting. And what has our country done? We barely blinked. We barely blinked. And that, to me, is unacceptable. We have seen horrendous acts of violence. Horrendous. The Las Vegas shooting, the Las Vegas massacre, Orlando, the Pulse nightclub shooting, Sandy Hook, and on and on and on. I remember I was in seventh grade when Columbine happened. And I remember thinking, there's no way this could ever happen again. How devastating, how awful. And here we are, here we are. I think it's time, more than time, that we elect leaders who are courageous enough to pursue action. It's not enough to have thoughts and prayers after every shooting and barely blame 
plate and go on with our lives. It, I mean, we are far past that. The time is now to act. So I am for common sense gun legislation that seeks to reduce gun violence. I will say that again. Common sense gun legislation that seeks to reduce gun violence, period. I don't want to infringe on anybody's Second Amendment rights, but this epidemic that we have in terms of gun violence and gun deaths in this country is unacceptable. So I think that we need to absolutely have universal background checks. Universal, meaning if it's a private sale, we need to have a record, and that person should have a background check done. If, if someone has a restraining order because they have a dating relationship, not just marriage, that should be cause for denial of the gun license, right? We have all these loopholes in our system. I think we need to ban these bump stocks, and I think we need to deny the concealed carry. There's so much work to do, it's time for action. Thank you. So I think if you're in your 20s, you've heard three times in your adult life the mass, the deadliest mass shooting in American history, and Las Vegas being the most recent one. Uh, Ninety-some percent of the country agree that universal background checks, that uh, closing the gun, gun show loophole are common sense approach to solving that problem. It's the, it's the like, very, very small portion of this country does not agree with that. Unfortunately, they wield a huge influence through the NRA. I have members of my board in Montgomery that have concealed carry license and went through the class. They're responsible gun owners. I'm not looking to take their guns away from them. They're also going to be following the law with those guns. Uh, but, I, but I think that we can all agree on uh, criminals and those that are uh, mentally unstable should not be should not have access to guns. Uh, if you're on the no-fly list, you shouldn't have access to guns, and we should know that. Uh, we have to decide as a country. We have two choices. One, we can just assume and come to reality that this is the America that we live in now. That mass shootings are going to happen and they're going to come up second as the top uh, story at night on CNN. Or we can decide to do something about that. And frankly, I don't think you fix any of this stuff until you get money out of politics. Because the, the $13,000 that Randy Holkern took from the IRA over the last eight years is not enough to buy or sell him, but it's the millions upon millions of dollars that they can use against him if he doesn't vote with them in Congress. And so that's the first thing we need to do to fix a liter literally almost all of our problems is to overturn the Citizens United, uh, but obviously stand with uh, sensible gun, gun solutions and gun, uh, gun control. Thank you. said is, is spot on. I think that the, uh, the Vegas shooting was very telling in what happened there. Uh, and I do agree with the universal background check. Um, and it is very vital that we do get money out of politics. Citizens United is very important as well. I'm going to tie that into it. But, uh, but there's not much more I can really add to it. I'm, I'm all for the background check. Thank you. The worst day of the school year for me is the violent intruder drill. I didn't get into education because I wanted to lock a door and hide kids in a corner and hear a police officer shoot off uh, fake bullets into the air. I got into education because I wanted to help students. But since my fifth year of teaching, when Columbine happened, we've had to do violent intruder drills every year. And they changed over time, but it is the worst day of the year because it's not why I'm there. And it's sad. It's a sad state of affairs that that's where we're at. Matt had a great answer. We need to get money out of politics, we need to have universal background checks, and we need to have common sense gun laws, as Lauren mentioned as well. The other thing we need to do is we need to allow the government to study the effects of gun violence. Right now, the NRA blocks all of that study. And we need to learn why 
they're doing that and why what gun violence does to, to people in, this, in society. Thank you. It seems like in some circles in the United States it's easier to buy a gun than it is to vote. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we have to draw the same between Republican politicians and the Republican voters. We have to do the same thing with the NRA. We have to draw the same NRA hierarchy, NRA membership. I went to a target range in Crystal Lake about three months ago, and I spoke to responsible gun owners. Responsible gun owners are for sound legislation. They believe in getting the right training before they are offered their FOID card. And as, as Lauren mentioned earlier, it seems like every other day, you know, mass shooting apparently is, is defined by four or more deaths. Well, there's, on average, I, I believe that there's been a mass shooting every day in the month of 2018. That is really pathetic. And, well, a little bit of history. On the day of the Sandy Hook massacre, when 21 young children's lives were lost and several adults, on the same day, within 24 hours, in Japan, there were 21 students stabbed and nobody died. I'm, I'm for Second Amendment right, rights, okay? But we have to come up with a mutual understanding, you know, somewhere between a musket and a tank, okay? Well, where is that middle ground? Reduced size of magazines is something I would propose. But common sense legislation, the things that were mentioned earlier, that's what we have to do. Thank you very much. I'm going to pretty much repeat what everybody else said here. Uh, I'm for common sense gun control, and the reason I'm for that is because I believe that as a representative, we have to implement the will of the people. And I like to look at, I love statistics, I love uh, public opinion polls. It turns out that 85% of gun owners are for common sense gun legislation. Therefore, 85%, that's, that's a huge number. Okay, uh, and when you look at the NRA, right now the NRA controls the gun laws that we have in this country. And I, I think it's either two or there are two or five million people in the NRA. I can't remember which, what the numbers. But either way, that's 1% of the population. 1% of the population is controlling this. That shows how, how uh, dysfunctional our government is and how much we need to take it back. Okay, we can't allow, we can't allow 1% of the people in this country work. It's, this is an extremist organization. And they don't do anything based on facts and data, which is not the right thing either. We need to we need to take back our government, and getting the citizens united will will go a, a long way in, in doing stuff like that. So um, that's my opinion. Thank you. Okay, so these are these next this next question is kind of a combined uh, series that was presented by the um, Kendall Dent. So it's, uh, it's, I'm sure it's no big surprise that there was a march uh, in Chicago. Um, I can't remember now, the days of bleeding together. Was it a week ago? Only a week ago, two weeks ago? Something like that? Um, and I believe uh, in the United States, over four million people marched in various events on that day. The largest in the that the United States has seen so far. Um, that being said, if we look across this table, um, there is a gender issue here that uh, is being asked. Um, in the light of the movement, and if the future is, is female, how do you fit in? Coupled with, I think the question, um, we provide this with the question of choice, as well as Me Too. So this is a big chunk, but I think it's important to ask. So, and it was on the list that was given to them ahead of time. So starting with Matt Crawley. 
Thank you. Um, so I guess I'll start at the end of what I was going to say. I was down in Chicago a couple weeks ago, or last week at the march, uh, and moved by not only the turnout, but the support uh, from the husbands and from the men that are important in these women's lives. Uh, to be there supporting, supportive of women running in, in all forms of government, uh, and that. So I, I really enjoyed being there. Uh, the Me Too movement, you know, the one thing that I was going to say on that is that Congress has set its own rules uh, for how to uh, deal with accusations uh, that really isn't the same playing field that all of us live, live by with our uh, companies and uh, agencies that we work for. Theirs is secretive in non-disclosure agreements and uh, paid off with taxpayer dollars that none of us ever knew about until a few weeks ago. And so that's wrong. They need to live by the same rules that we need to live by. That an accusation needs to be investigated. And people who violate their HR manual need to be terminated. And so I'm very supportive of, uh, of women and equal pay and uh, choice. The one thing that I will say is I stand before you as a middle-aged white guy. So I, I, I fully acknowledge that I do not know very uh, specifically what it is like to be in your shoes, but I can tell you I will be right next to you helping fight whatever fight it is because that's what the Democratic Party stands for. Thank you. Moving down to Mr. Costa. The, uh, it's interesting, I just did a, I was just at a classroom uh, today and uh, I did a mock election and I put several different names on that on that list and uh, just to do an experiment. And it was interesting that the ladies won, so that was a good thing. Uh, it's interesting that, that we have, I, I believe it's roughly 52% of our population, if not higher than that, is made up of women. Sadly enough, uh, contrary to that, our government leadership, uh, there's only a handful of women in, as senators. It's only been recent that they've even entered that, that leadership role. But I do believe that and I do support that that idea, that ideology is changing, where women are getting more involved. Uh, and we need, we need to see more women involved in our, in our leadership. I think we get better results in many cases, because sometimes it appears that women can be more trustworthy in a lot of ways, in my opinion. So with that said, uh, I think things are changing in the right direction. Uh, when it comes to choice, uh, I am, I am pro-life. I am one of the rare pro-life candidates in the country that are Democratic. And, uh, and one of the changes I do believe that needs to be done is the tri third tri-semester where um, abortions are legal at this point. I believe it should be reduced and then eliminate. It should be eliminated, it should be a uh, step in that direction. Also, uh, uh, my position on uh, body parts being sold, I think that's something that should be eliminated as well. Thank you. Me Too Act, which uh, will give 
uh, legal services to victims of sexual harassment, provide an online reporting system, and no longer uh, accept non-disclosure agreements and not allow for the uh, funds to come out of taxpayer money to settle those claims. But that's not enough. A larger problem is, and a larger thing that we need to work on, is to provide equal pay for equal work. We need to ensure that uh, women can make their own decisions with their own bodies. They don't need my advice. My wife certainly doesn't need it. Uh, and we need to ensure that we ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Thank you.
the, the culture is changing, and this is just another step, and we're moving in the right direction, and we're not there yet, but we, we're getting there. So. And right now, we all have a choice between all of you and one person who's not here. So what makes you different and what makes you the person that can beat Randy Holcomb? We're starting with, back down to, lost. he went first just last time, I think it's just lost up. Yep. What makes you different than the folks up here, and what makes you winnable? Um, I think by now you've kind of realized I'm a different candidate. Um, I basically ran two years ago with about 500 bucks, talked to people, put up my own website, didn't have any professional help, and was probably the closest primary, second closest primary in the state when it comes to understanding what the average Democrat really looks at and what they really believe in, um, I think I got a pretty good handle on it. I also have a pretty good handle on understanding what the moderate Republicans are about. I believe wholeheartedly I can unseat him if I'm given the chance. And so if you want to see a change, it's only happened six times in a hundred years. If you want to see it happen seven times, the number of perfection. Then you have to uh, vote for the number two guy. And if you need John Hostler, hope to uh, represent you in the next election. Thank you. The reason I feel I have a chance to win this race against Randy Halpern is I'm not a bureaucrat, I'm not a lifelong politician, I'm an educator and a Navy veteran. I spent three years in the United States Navy. I earned a Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal, 
I was honorably discharged, and I've spent the last 18 years working to teach children about civics, to teach children about their government, to teach children to get involved. And I've done that admirably, and I've done that well. I believe that I can beat Randy Hulkren because I believe that I'm passionate about the issues, and I'm passionate about the most vulnerable in society and them having their needs met, and I believe that that is something that can be spread across party lines. Thank you. The real winners here in the 14th congressional districts are the voters. You know, we have seven individuals spreading the democratic message, and that can be nothing but good things for the party. I knew when I got into the race last time around, I knew I was going to be outspent. But I promised my volunteers then, as I promised the volunteers and voters of the 14th district, I will be outspent, I will not be out hustled. I'm not running against my primary opponents. I'm running for the people of the 14th Congressional District. I've demonstrated my ability to speak out against the status quo. I'm not going to be to the Democratic Party, though, what Randy Hogan is to the Republican Party, and that's a rubber stamp. I will do what is right and just not what the party tells me what to do. I promise you that. I will bring true representation to the people of the 14th Congressional District. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, since the 14th District is a, a heavily, I, I want to say heavily Republican district, it's uh, quite a bit more Republican than Democratic. You know, Electing, putting somebody in as a Democratic candidate is, we need to put somebody in there who's, who's uh, electable, who's, who's going to be able to convince Republicans, a lot of the moderate Republicans, to come over uh, to the Democratic side. Um, being an engineer, I believe in doing things that are based on facts and science. And I spent my career convincing other people to, to come up, to follow my ideas and to implement my ideas. My last job uh, as an engineer, I spent seven years flying around the world uh, to primarily Asia. I was in China about 15 times, Korea, Thailand, Malaysia, basically licensing American technology. And I had to do that by convincing others that our technology was the best, even though they had a choice of other technology. And I was able to do that. I'm going to, whoever the candidate is, the Democratic candidate, is going to have to do the same thing in, uh, in the 14th district. So I think I have an advantage here. I know how to do that. I've, I've done it before. And we need to convince Republicans to come over to our side based on facts. We need to convince them based on science. There are about a third of the Republicans that are not going to come over. I can tell you that much. They're real hardcore right-wingers. But there are a lot of moderates out there. I know that based on uh, going around uh, collecting signatures and canvassing. So it is doable. I live in the 14th district. My wife and I live in the 14th district, and whether I win or lose, I'm still going to be here. So I want to, again, it's, it's really an important consideration that we have to look at is we have to make sure we have somebody there who's electable. And, uh, and also, I want to say that, you know, whoever is a candidate is going to have to go up against Randy in debates. I can tell you that uh, he doesn't like facts and data. I love them. So, I'll, I'll <laughs> so anyways, George Weber for Congress. Thank you. For a serious leader, and my name is Lauren Underwood. I'm a serious candidate running a real campaign to become your congresswoman. I am the only person running in a Democratic primary with federal experience. The only candidate who has worked on Capitol Hill. The only candidate who is ready to go to Washington on day one and be a representative. And that's important because this job that I'm applying for, that I'm speaking with all of you about, and running this campaign. It's to unseat a member of Congress who's been in office since 2011. I understand that. And so in, in offering my, my experience and my qualifications, uh, I want to be real clear that I bring the background and skill set to do the job. Um, I think it's really important to also look at the support that I've built and really gained in the community. 
Um, we've been out talking to folks, knocking doors, having conversations and house parties, including ones that are coming up in this very community. Um, and we've been embraced by local activists. We've gotten endorsements from local groups and national groups like Emily's List. They are standing with our campaign. Um, the wave, you know, there's this, there's this idea that there's this democratic wave on the horizon, right? And that, that we are just going to be swept up in the wave and the Democrats are going to win out of this primary. Waves don't just happen. We in this room have to do the work to make it happen. And so we need to have a candidate that will join you in doing the work in our community to make sure that we can beat Mr. Holcren. Um, and finally, I just want to say, I've been so honored to be included in a group of women this year. They call us the Avengers. We're the women that marched in the Women's March and then launched our campaigns. The Avengers are out here in every community. There's Avengers in this room. I'm so honored and glad to join you all this evening. My name is Lauren Underwood. I appreciate your support. Thank you. So I think what, um, what I'd like to highlight here at the closing is you've seen but a, a snapshot of what we are, who we are, what we stand for tonight. Uh, I hope you like what you've heard from, from all of us. Pick a candidate, get behind a candidate, and uh, actively engage in this race. Um, I hope you've also seen that I take this very seriously. I uh, went down to part-time at my engineering job so I can campaign uh, full-time. And I really need to thank my wife for letting me do that. Um, but also, uh, doing the things that you need to do, being in every town that I can be, being in every meeting that I can be at, learning as much as I can. And I, what we've seen is uh, a groundswell of volunteers with our coffees and meet and greets and that kind of thing, but also earning the support of uh, folks like Congressman Bill Foster, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, the AFL-CIO in Illinois, Citizen Action, and then we have a national endorsement coming out tomorrow uh, as well. And so I only say that to tell you that I'm taking this very seriously. I've filled out every questionnaire that I can that lines up with, with my values because it's going to take an organization of people bigger than this room to take down a sitting congressman. And so I ask all of you again to get behind the candidate and let's look 14 this year. Thank you. almost dismissed, but not yet. So what, what's really important as well is whomever comes out of this primary on March 7th, and you can early vote, right, uh, starting February 8th, thank you, Chairman. Um, so I encourage you to do that. But whoever comes out of this primary, remember that you need to stand behind whomever, man or woman, whoever that is, in order to get them to that finish line in November. Because we only do it if we're all in it together and we're all in it to win it. Because it is a steep hill to climb, but it's not something that is so insurmountable when we all work together. So I know we also want other little bit of business. I know we have some candidates in the room that are not running for Congress. Can you wave hello? Say who you are if you're in the room. Anyone? <laughs> Going? Yes? All right. Uh, thank you all for coming today. I very much appreciate my first forum. I was able to attend, so thank you that. Um, my name is Andrew Torres. I am going to be the Democratic candidate for the 75th District for State uh, House, State Representative, currently held by David Walter. Um, if you are familiar with him, Hopefully you're familiar with his 8% voting record for labor um, and other terrible policies that he's been behind that are going against our working communities here. Um, so I hope to meet all of you as I go around the 75th. Uh, and again, my name is Andrew Norris, and I'm running for state representative. So. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Going once, going twice. All right, well, thank you again for coming out, and one more grand round of applause for our wonderful